Hello and welcome to the Herald Gaming Channel. Today we dive into the lore of the Char and the High Legions, so when bound by bloodlands in a few days, you will have a better understanding of this glorious militaristic society. But before I do, I want to say a heartfelt thank you to all my wonderful Patreons who keep this one woman show on the road. If you would like to join them, links below. So this is the story of the Cha and their tumultuous history. In the beginning, before humanity invaded Atiria, the Cha were in ascendance. Hailing from the eastern lands beyond the Blaze Ridge Mountains, this warrior race evolved from disparate, warring tribes to a colossal, imperial nation who held sway over the lands from Blade Ridge to Ascalon and beyond. This paradigm-shifting transformation was in large part due to the rise of the first Khan Ur, an enigmatic and now legendary Char leader who united the warring clans, unifying his people under a single banner for the first time in their history. When creating the law of the Char, the narrative team looked to Genghis Khan and the nomadic tribes of Northern Asia which he forged into the Mughal Empire. Even using the Khan honorific in acknowledgement of this truly remarkable military mind. Now freed from the cycle of unending civil war, the Khan focused the might of his nation and heralded in a golden age of technological advancement and territorial expansion. Now that is not to say the Char stood unopposed. The dwarves, centaurs, and growl occupied much of the land now held by the legions. But the one race who was able to hold back the tide of Char ambition was the Forgotten. However, that stall in expansion was brief as the Forgotten were called away to the Crystal Sea, now desert. That epic saga is a tale unto itself for another day. The true check of Char power arrived in 100 BE with the humans. Hailing from a world beyond the mists, Humanity fought to claim much of Tyria as their own. From their first arrival in 786 BE in Cantha, humanity had conquered not just those lands, but established an empire stretching from the stronghold in Kayang, north to Alona, and across the seas to the continent of Or by the year 205 BE. When these two superpowers finally clashed, the outcome of the conflict was by no means assured, for these two invading armies were well matched. But a nation divided cannot stand, and the very strength and unity the Kano embodied would be its downfall. His legend, his power, his vision was the center, the Axis Mundi, around which the disparate clans orbited, and in the wake of his assassination, chaos bloomed. With no heir apparent, the Char nation fractured into four legions. The four High Legions. Flame, Iron, Blood, and Ash. Each legion being led by a cub of the late Khan Or. In fact, from that day onwards, all imperators, the leaders of the four High Legions, have claimed kinship to the first Khan Or although the veracity of their claims is almost impossible to verify. Now, humanity faced an enemy bent on self-destruction, with legion pitted against legion, their defeat was in no small part a self-inflicted wound. Sadly, honest self-reflection is a painful and difficult undertaking even for an individual, but for a prideful nation, it is all but impossible. Rather than learning from their defeat, the Char assigned the blame for their loss to the power of the human gods. By 898 after Exodus, this belief was ubiquitous, and over the centuries the Char had sought a means to bring equal celestial power to bear, to match that of the humans. So when the Flame Legion encountered the Titans at the volcano of Harangmir, they believed their search was over. The power of the Titans was immense, and unaware of the true nature of these beings, it is little wonder the shamans of the flame mistook their raw power. 
or divinity. Born in the foundry of failed creations, in the hellish realm of anguish, the demonic titans were able to adapt their form, taking on the characteristics of the worlds and regions they found themselves in. To the shamans, they appeared as the living embodiment of the fiery heart of the world. If the shamans had encountered them in the frozen north, however, they would have resembled frozen hulks. In the realms of torment, titans are flesh-twisted abominations. The stuff of nightmares. In truth, these monstrosities are nothing more than tortured souls, empowered by the malice of a forgotten god. The char would learn at great cost the true nature of their saviors, but not before all the high legions had fallen under their thrall. Basking in the new power gifted to them by their titan gods, the shaman casts of flame, iron, ash, and blood ascended, claiming rulership to reform their nation. Where the death of the Ganu had broken the empire, the birth of a new religion bound the high legions together once more. But no nation is a monolith, and many resisted, the most notable of which was Bethia Havokbringer. She led an insurgency against the shamans and their gods, which only ended with her death. For her act of defiance, Bethia was sacrificed to the titans, and was still. The ruling caste then declared all female char unfit to serve in the fighting ranks of the legions. Stripped of their weapons and rank, ripped from their warbands, females were made drudges, fit to breed, to tend to the cubs, condemned to a life of domestic servitude and indignation. With the insurgency quelled and emboldened by the power gifted to them by their new titan gods, the Char exacted their revenge upon humanity. A nation divided cannot stand, and this time it was the human's turn to learn that most bitter truth. For it was not just geography that divided the humans of Tyria. After centuries of expansion and prosperity, greed and lust for personal power had poisoned this once united people. In 1070, the Char fell upon the Great Northern Wall and broke it. This was the first assault in a campaign of destruction which would become known as the Searing. The city of Ascalon found itself under siege as the cauldron of cataclysm, a titan gift to the Char, enabled the shamans to rain down destruction upon the city. King Adelban and his people defended their city as they watched the rest of Ascalon fall to their enemies. The assault on Ascalon city and the flight of the Ascalonian refugees led by Prince Rurik is the opening chapter of the very first Guild Wars campaign, Prophecies. I highly recommend a playthrough if only for the lore. With the Ascalonia assault in a full swing, the emboldened Char looked to awe and Kreiter. They would wipe humanity from the face of Northern Tyria. In the year 1071, with the Char legions bearing down on the Kingdom of Awe, the fall of the second human nation seemed all but certain. And indeed, Awe was fated to fall, but not at the hands of the Char. The puppet of a fallen god would be the instrument of its destruction. The now infamous Vizier Kilbron, sealing the fate of a continent, uttering words of power, words in the hand of Abaddon, god of secrets and water. The Sea of Sorrows claimed human and char alike that day. The last remaining stronghold of humanity was the Kingdom of Kreiter, and if not for the White Mantle and their unseen gods, they too would have likely succumbed to the onslaught of the Char invasion. So in desperation, the people of Kreiter abandoned the old gods, and much like the Char, traded their free will and faith, but it was not conquest that they sold their souls for but survival. 
indeed Kreiter and its people still, endure, and back then the Cha were forced to retreat. If you would like to know the true cost of their bargain with the Unseen Ones, there is a link in the top right hand corner of your screen to the lore video I made about that. The war had taken its toll on the High Legions, who were entrenched still in Ascalon and reeling at the terrible losses at Or, not to mention the defeat in Kryta. But worse was still to come. In 1072, the Flame Seeker Prophecies, a collection of predictions made by the dragon prophet Glint in 272 after Exodus, were finally coming to fruition. If you want to hear that story, links in the top right hand corner of your screen. The prophecy's significance to the Char relates to their new gods, the Titans, for as the consequences of the enactment of that prophecy unfolded, the Titans were unleashed upon the world. It was a tide of destruction, but ultimately, the Legion bore witness to the fall, the death, the defeat of their gods. Beings they worshipped and believed immortal fell to the might of the Ascalonian heroes, the human enemies they fought. This revelation, much like the assassination of the Khan Ur, rocked the foundations of Cha society. The ruling shaman caste hold on power, teetered on the brink, and added to that the entrenched war with the humans, that precious unity the Flame Legion had forged under the Titan's power was all but gone. Frantic to regain the dwindling authority of the Shaman caste, Hierophant Burnsoul of the Flame sought a new source of power and found it in the newly emerging destroyers, minions of the Elder Dragon Primordus. He sought to make those monsters the new, new gods of his people, even sacrificing char dissenters to them. Pyre fierce shot ended Bad Soul, and with him his plans, setting the stage and eventually leading a revolution against the supremacy of the ruling class. But before their overthrow, the shamans ordered an all-out assault on Ascalon City, thinking a victory over the humans would sure up their failing leadership. Twenty years after the searing, King Adelburn and his battle-weary army still held, refusing to surrender, refusing to submit to the treaties of Kryta and their unseen gods. Adelbur would be damned if he would allow Ascalon City to fall into the hands of his enemy, and damned he would be. This last assault on the city was brutal and unrelenting. The king's army, already pressed beyond limits, buckled and gave flight. Incensed by their betrayal and mind broken by a lifetime of war, he did the unspeakable. He unleashed the full fire with the destruction of the blessed blade of the gods, Magdia, sister sword to Zahothan, the blade of Balthazar himself. His madness not only killed hundreds of Cha, but his own people, condemning their souls to unending suffering. With their victory in Ascalon denied, potentially forever, and coupled with the fall of their titan gods, simmering dissent in the Cha ranks boiled over into outright revolution. Ash, iron and blood turned on the shamans in their ranks, and wage war against the Flame Legion. Broken as they were, the Flame were as formidable as the fire they commanded. The armies of iron, ash and blood had suffered and dwindled in their decades of war. It was only when Kala Scorchraiser and her army of a female Char joined the battle that the tide shifted in their favour. The spirit of the warrior is not easily broken, and the females of the Char did not take their fate lying down. They had never ceased their training, they had never truly hung up their blades. For generations they had trained in secret, biding their time, waiting for a moment when they could regain their honour, their status, and their true place 
on the fields of battle. After the surrender of the Flame Legion on the plains of Gulhain, the Cha were free. Free from their false gods, free to march into battle at the side of their sisters in arms, and free to make war against the humans. The Flame were banished, cast out of Cha society. Today, Ascalon belongs to the Cha, all but Ascalon City and Ebonhawk. With the rise of the dragons, peace treaties were forged with the other nations, treaties that will endure at least as long as the dragon threat remains. Still, the Cha are wary of the changing dynamics of the conflict and the consequences of the fall of three elder dragons and the rise of a new power, an unknown quantity, Aurene. So this is the history of the Cha. I hope it enriches your enjoyment of Banned by Blood. There will be more Guild Wars 2 lore coming very soon, with a deep dive into the story of Ritlock, as well as a brief history of the Norn and their connection with the Coden. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, subscribe, ring that bell so I don't disappear into the mists of YouTube, and do show some love to Ada, Kilda, Kyle Nelson, Christopher Martin, Jason Venter, Cobb, Hain, Jolly Joestar, Molini, and all my wondrous, fantabulous Patreons, without whom I would be unable to dedicate the time and resources I do to my content creation. I can never thank them all enough. And if you feel inspired to dive into Guild Wars 2, there are referral links below to the free-to-play game and the Path of Fire expansion, which now gives you access to all the wonderful content of the Heart of Thorns expansion 2. Thanks to the generosity of ArenaNet and their partner program, of whom I am a proud affiliate. Using any of these referral links directly supports my channel, but costs you not a penny more. Now I hope you will join me again very soon for more Guild Wars 2 goodness. But until then, as always, thanks for watching.